Okay, how many of you are still without power? Anybody still without power? Everybody got power? Great. How about, how about telephone service? Any still missing telephone? I got my telephone back on this morning when I woke up, so I've been without that for two weeks. That's nice to have back. Sorry about yours. And it's interesting, that old deal about when you're out of... When your, your neighbor's out of work, it's a recession. When you're out of work, it's a depression. That's kind of how it's working with the various problems. I, I've noticed that my interest in uh, the power problem went down significantly once I had my back. <laughs> I, was, I was really worried about all my neighbors until I got my power back. And then suddenly, it wasn't that big of a problem anymore. So. <laughs> All right, how many of you are still out of, without cable? Without cable, raise your hands. Oh, quite a few. No internet service. Okay. I tell you what, it's been, it's been quite an experience. We did get our power back last Friday night, so that was like one week, two hours short of one week. The boil water edict went off Saturday noon, so we could drink water without boiling it. Of course, we didn't have any power before that to boil it anyway. But, And then, I've been all week without telephone, cable, TV, internet service. And, uh, you know, it's, I told my wife, I feel like I'm living in a high-class refugee camp. It's just been... <laughs> And then we decided we were going to be leaving town anyway last weekend. So on right after the Bible study last week, I said, there's no sense uh, prolonging this. Let's just leave. So we left and heading up towards Atlanta. And our car started lurching out on I-75. So I said, oh, gosh, what are we going to do? Well, I called the number in the manual in the glove compartment. And they hooked me right up to a service department in Macon, Georgia, 49 miles ahead, according to the sign. So we, we sort of nursed it in. We got six miles from the dealership. The car died, called the tow truck. Uh, that was like at 4 o'clock. 4.45, we're at the dealership. They diagnosed the problem, had the part, had us on the road at 5.45. So that was quite a unique, I mean, you know, just think about all the possibilities there. That was just unbelievably uh, good. So I was calling somebody on the telephone. I, I don't remember who. It might have been a, my son or daughter, somebody. And, uh, and they were expressing their condolences for all of these problems that I've been going through. And I, and I said this, and I think it's a pretty big idea. I said, you know, we don't have any problems. These are not problems. These are the inconveniences of affluence. There's nothing that's gone on in my life that is anything other than an inconvenience of some affluent part of my life. So we, we don't really have any problems. These are not problems. These are not real. There are people in the world who really do have problems. Now, some of you may be those people, but they don't have to do with power and Internet access. They have to do with real problems. And we're going to look at a story of a man this morning who has some real problems. This is a guy who has some real problems going on. We're looking at the life of David. And there are some injustices taking place here. There are four people that are kind of, we'll see here today, Absalom, his son, is trying to take his life. And then he has a man who basically works for him, who deceives him. And then he has a uh, competitor, let's say, like a business competitor, sort of, who taunts him as he is being chased out of town. And then he has a very close friend who betrays him. And so this is a guy who has some real problems. These are not just mere inconveniences. Uh, today we want to look at how to respond to injustice. That's kind of the, the topic. 
you'll notice that the name of the message is called Waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord. And we'll see how waiting for the Lord and responding to injustice tie together as, as we work in, into the message. Okay. Now, your injustices, I mean, they, they could be all over. You could be in a position right now where you have uh, an employee who is deceiving you. You could, like David, or you could be in a position where you have a close friend who has betrayed you, your trust. Or you might be in a position this morning, like David, where you have uh, an enemy or a competitor who, who's taunting you, is just kind of making life miserable. Maybe they keep saying lies about your product, trying to take your deal away. Uh, I do know of some situations here where and elsewhere where men have spent many months on big deals that have fallen apart. And uh, so because of deception and lies that have taken place. Your injustice might be that you have a vendor who hasn't been paying you on a timely basis and you're having trouble figuring out how to pay your bills downstream because the vendor is treating you unjustly. Those are just the, the, the work and relationship. But you know, also in the family, it could be that like David, you have, you have someone in your family who is... Uh, making life miserable for you. It could be your wife. It could be your parents. It could be your wife's parents. It could be your wife and her parents. It could be just almost anything that is just making life miserable, and it is unjust. It's injustice. It's not fair. It's not right. It's, it's dead wrong. And that's the situation in which David finds himself... And I think there's a, there's a wonderful, small, wonderful lesson here for us how we can respond to injustice by looking at the way David responded to injustice and get a lesson. All right, so here's where we want to go this morning. The first thing we want to do is we want to talk about uh, this whole idea of waiting for the Lord. And we want to talk about what does it mean, what does it look like, and how does it work. Okay, so the first thing I want us to do is I want us to keep our fingers in 2 Samuel, keep your finger there, and turn over to Psalm chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3. As it turns out, there is a what's called a superscription at the beginning of Psalm chapter 3, it is not part of God's inerrant word. It's called a superscription, but it comes from deep in history. It's not some recent edition. And it says at the beginning of Psalm 3 in this superscript, it says, A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Ah, Okay, so we are this morning looking at the story of when David is fleeing from his son Absalom. And this is a psalm that David wrote as a result of that. And let's read it together. Verse 1, O Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. These are the people that I just mentioned to you. Verse 3, but you are a shield around me, O Lord, my glorious one who lifts up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. We'll see in a moment how... The entire army of Israel is marshaled against David. There literally are tens of thousands of people coming after him. Verse 7. 
Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the jaw. You have broken the teeth of the wicked. It's from the Lord where deliverance comes. May your blessing be on your people. So this is, uh, this is the state of mind, the state of the heart of David. He, he's calling out to, to God. What he's doing, the Bible calls this waiting for the Lord. Uh, just again, keeping your finger in Second Samuel, go to Psalm chapter 27, verse 13. Psalm 27, verse 13, David writes this. He says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Take a look at Psalm, verse, Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. There are other verses that you'll be have the opportunity to look up in your discussion time. They're on the questions, but these are just a few. Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't give us information about when David wrote this psalm, but this could easily have been when he was finally delivered from this, this injustice, even the one we're going to be talking about here in a moment. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. There is this concept in the scriptures of waiting on the Lord, of not taking matters into your own hands. So, what does it mean to, to wait on the Lord? What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, basically, it means not taking matters into your own hands. The norm is, the norm is, is that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We, we think through our problems. We develop strategies. We put energy in and uh, all of our strength, we throw those things at our injustices, at our problems. We use our own best logic. We try to logic our way out of problems. That's, that's the norm. That's the, that's, the, that's the way the world works. But we're going to see in this text that is, that is not how David works. Chapter 15, verse 30. David is now fleeing from his son Absalom, leaving Jerusalem. It says, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. Verse 31. Now David had been told, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom, who is Ahithophel. Ahithophel is probably an older man, but one of his most trusted advisors. So David prayed, O Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. Now, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, one thing it doesn't mean is to be an idiot. It doesn't mean that you don't try to protect your position. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, said, Jesus says, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be what? Wise. Wise or shrewd as serpents and gentle as doves. So be shrewd. Don't be an idiot. Don't, in, injustice doesn't mean you just go looking for your, um, what, 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 what's the word? The aggressor and invite them to, to harm you. No, it doesn't mean that at all. So David actually prays that Ahithophel's... Now that's kind of interesting because what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, one of the things it means is it means to pray. It means to bring, bring the matter before God. Oh Lord, you are, the, you are the one who can deliver me. 
So I'm praying, as in Psalm 3, right here. And then, as it turns out, David has a friend, Hushai, the archite, and he, in the verses 32 through 37 of 15, he arranges for his friend to go back to Jerusalem. And look what it says in verse 34. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I'll be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. And so that's what he did. Then in chapter 16, verses 1 through 5, there's a story we're not going to go into. It's the story of Ziba. Ziba is um, the man who is managing Mephibosheth's property. Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son who's been crippled. And, uh, and David restored all of Saul's property to Mephibosheth. And Ziba is the manager. And Ziba comes along and betrays his master, Mephibosheth, and lies and deceives what's going on. And I think we may come back to that when the resolution takes place, maybe later in the series, maybe not. Then from verse 5 down through verse 14 is the story of Shimea. Shimea is a relative of Saul. And Shimea, just notice one thing in verse 6, as David is leaving town, it says that he, he was there and he pelted David and all the king's officials with stones. And he also was throwing dirt on them later. And Abishai, who is David's nephew and a warrior, wants to go kill this guy. Well, of course he does. But, in verse 10, the king said, What do you and I have in common, you sons of Zariah? Now, Zariah is his sister, David's sister. And uh, this guy that wants to go kill Abishai, that's, that's his nephew. If he is cursing me, because the Lord said to him, Curse David, who can ask, why do you do this? David said to Abishai and all his officials, My son, who is my own flesh, has tried to take my life. How much more than this Benjamite? Saul was a Benjamite. This is a relative. Leave him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I am receiving today. So what does it mean to wait on the Lord? It means that we, we don't have to defend our own injustices. Sometimes things are happening because of a, a concept, a theological concept called ambiguous providence. We, it's ambiguous. We don't understand why God is allowing the thing that he's allowing. It's ambiguous, but there are reasons for it. And if we take matters into our own hands, then we thwart the opportunity for God to do his will, for God to bring deliverance, for God to take care of us. So... What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, one thing it means, it means that, that we don't take matters into our own. We don't have to defend ourselves. So that brings us to the big idea for the day. The big idea for the day. And the big idea for the day is this. The most powerful way to respond to injustice is to wait for the Lord. The single most powerful way to respond to injustice is to wait for the Lord. Just exactly what David is doing here in this text. I think I've probably already taken you away from Psalm 3, so don't try to go there again. But just listen to this again. You are a shield around me. He answers me from his holy hill. The Lord sustains me. 
From the Lord comes deliverance. The most powerful response to injustice is to wait for the Lord to do what the Lord is going to do. All right, well, what does, so that's what it means in theory. Uh, what does it look like in practice? That's the next thing to talk about here. We, we're talking about what it means in theory. Now let's talk about what it looks like in, uh, in practice. Well, go back with me to, again, back to chapter 15, verse 31. So David prayed, O Lord, Turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. Okay, there's one thing it looks like in practice. Go to chapter 16. Verse 11, David then said to Abishai, my son who's trying to, you know, take my life, leave him alone, let him curse but the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with goodness for the cursing I'm receiving. So he prayed. He entrusts himself to the sovereignty of a good and gracious God. And then another little thing takes place beginning at verse 15. This is the advice of Ahithophel. Uh, I'm going to scroll forward with you and then we'll go back. Look at verse 23. Last verse in 17. It says, Now in those days, the advice of Ahithophel was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. This was a very incredible guy. Now back up to verse 15. It says, Absalom and the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with them. Very interesting. He has deserted David. Why did he do that? Verse 20, Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? Now, this is, this is David's like most trusted counselor and, and, and a friend. And in verse 21, he says, lie with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. David has left 10 of his concubines at the palace to take care of it. And now Ahithophel says, go sleep with your father's concubines. Let all Israel hear, and you will become a stench in your father's nostrils. And the hands of everyone with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent, and Absalom went and slept with all of his father's concubines. Unbelievable advice. Why would he do that? What's going on here? Why would he do that? <clears throat> Hithphel also gave the advice for Absalom to assemble 12,000 troops and go after David right now. Get him while he's tired and weary. Kill him. And bring all the other people back alive. Why is he giving that advice? <clears throat> Keep your finger here and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3. <clears throat> if you don't want to bounce around, that's fine. You can just listen to these readings. But I, I think it is helpful to, to see them as well. Verse 3, it says, David sent someone to find out about her, Bathsheba. The man said, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You know, we always focus on Bathsheba. Sometimes we focus on Uriah, but we very rarely focus on the fact that she's somebody's daughter. There's some father whose daughter has been seduced into adultery and whose son eventually dies. So that's some daddy's grandson who dies. And that's some daddy's daughter who has been seduced into adultery. And the man, that man is Eliam. <clears throat> now, turn over to chapter 23, verse 34b, the last half of verse 34. I usually don't get this intricate with you on the scriptures. I do this kind of study every week. I, look at, I, I try to have five sentences for every sentence I speak. You know, so there's backup. 
So I don't share all this with you every week, but I do this every week, this kind of careful study. But this week, it's so interesting that I want you to see this for yourself. Chapter 23, uh, verse 34, <clears throat> second half, it says, Eliam, now remember, that's Bathsheba's father, right? And this is a list of David's 30 mighty men. It says, Eliam, son of, uh-oh, guess who? Ahithophel. Interesting. Ahithophel, it turns out, is Bathsheba's grandfather. And so, this man who trusted David so profoundly and was his advisor, that man, David, went and seduced my granddaughter and got her pregnant and the son died. And not only that, he killed my granddaughter's husband. And he just never got over it. He just never got over it. So waiting for the Lord, what does it look like? <clears throat> well, it's... It's very messy, this, this whole thing, this doing this life thing is very messy. And sometimes the injustices done against us are really consequences of injustices we ourselves have done, even if we've been forgiven. Hushai gives counsel <clears throat> that goes against Ahithophel's counsel. And... Uh, if you will look down at verse chapter 17, verse 14, Hushai basically gave the advice of assemble all of Israel and then go after David. And the reason he did this was to give David time to escape. And it says in verse 14, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai is better than that of Ahithophel. And then in my Bible, I have underlined with a, a red pen, and I underline verses in my Bible with a red pen when, when I think of it, that have to do with this, a sovereign act of God. And so this next sentence is a sovereign thing that God is doing. It says, For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. And so that's exactly what happens. And drop down to verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. Wow, what bitterness! Of heart that was. So, <clears throat> back to what it looks like waiting for the Lord. It means that we allow the Lord to mete out justice. We don't have to force it, we don't have to make it happen. Uh, again, the big idea this morning, I've done this before, maybe somebody could get that back on for me. The big idea this morning is. What? The most powerful response to injustice is to wait for the Lord. To wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord to deliver us. And how does it work? Thank you. How does it work? Gee, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> How does God help those who wait for themselves? Wait, wait for Him? How does God help those who wait for Him? Well, you see what He does with Ahithophel. Uh, also, He takes care of Ziba later, and He also takes care of Shimea later as well. Because the most powerful response to injustice is to wait for the Lord. 
And why do we, why do, we do this? Why do we wait? We, we wait because we, we, actually believe, we actually believe that God is more capable of orchestrating our deliverance than we are. I remember laying uh, on, I, I went over to Melbourne to speak at a CBMC luncheon or breakfast, I guess it was, breakfast. And I remember on the way back going by a property that, uh, you know, I made some mistakes on the property, but I was, I was pretty much, well, some people wanted me to die <laughs> because, I mean, they, they, they really wanted far more punishment for me. I mean, I deserve to bleed a little bit for it. I recognize that, but I didn't deserve to die. And these people, they, they wanted, they wanted my whole, they wanted everything. They wanted my whole life and they were coming after me big time. And it happened to be on the way back. Uh, from my trip to Melbourne. And so I went by the property and I went out behind the buildings. There were some workmen there doing some tenant construction. I remember going behind the buildings and getting out of my car and laying prostrate face down on the ground and weeping and crying out to God, begging him to deliver me because I had made the decision that I was not going to defend myself. Or another, said another way, I had made the decision that I was going to wait for the Lord to deliver me and that I was not going to try to orchestrate my own deliverance. But you know, you know that when you're in that position, you can feel very helpless. And I felt completely helpless. But uh, I persevered in that and it uh, eventually did work out. And so the message I came away then and the message that I come away again this week is simply this. The, the most powerful response to injustice is just to simply wait for the Lord. He will deliver you. So I don't know what, what, what it is that you need to be delivered from this morning. But please, don't take matters into your own hands. Because the most powerful way to respond is not to take matters into your own hands. It's to wait. It's to wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> our dearest Father, there are uh, no doubt many, many men in this room right now who are under the thumb of injustice whether they're being taunted or betrayed or deceived or just out and out cheated or have some family member doing something, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would give all of us the, the strength of character and courage to wait for you, your deliverance. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.